All right, it's 103. Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us today on the program on statements of support, how, when, and why your company should speak up on social issues. I'm Julie Granger. I'm the Executive Vice President of the MMAC, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Corey Joe Biddle, MMAC's Vice President of Community Relations and Executive Director of Fuel Milwaukee. Uh, CJ is going to help out and monitor the chat for all of those questions that I hope you brought to today's discussion. So please feel free to comment or post throughout the presentation. You don't need to wait until the end, and um, we will bring them out so our speakers can respond. So this topic or the questions um, have received a lot of attention in the past couple of years and with good reason. Uh, the answers are complicated by lots of factors and there is no one size fits all uh, solution or response. So bring on the experts. Today we have joining us uh, Deidre Garrett, who is the Director of HR Services and Organizational Development at MRA, the Management Association. MRA provides more than 4,000 organizations across four states with HR services, learning and development programs, talent management, benefits, and compensation services. Thanks for joining us, Deidre. Next, we have Andres Gonzalez, who is Vice President, Chief Diversity Officer at Freighter and the Medical College of Wisconsin. Andres provides holistic and integrated vision leadership and strategic planning for diversity, inclusion, and cultural competence throughout Freighter. He advises leadership and external stakeholders on topics relating to freight arts diversity and inclusion strategy. Andres is also the chair of the Region of Choice Task Force who helps guide our strategy and goals. And we have James Madlam, who is CEO of Miller Communications. In addition to his career in communications, James also has a law degree from Marquette and he has extensive experience in media relations, public relations and crisis communications. So you can see that we have um, assembled the A crew here to uh, answer your toughest questions, no pressure group. Um, and with that, I'll just kick off the discussion and I'll start with um, Deidre. So we are definitely in an age of increased transparency and accountability. What does that mean to companies um, from an HR perspective? And can you give us an example or two of the kinds of issues that these companies are um, either speaking out on or at least feeling some pressure to make a statement on. And other speakers, feel free to chime in with some examples. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, and I just want to preface with saying we have a chief diversity officer roundtable where this, uh, I guess, subject was really birthed out of where we bring together 35 area DEI leaders um, who are from cross sectors of um, various industries in the area. And we come together on a regular basis to talk about how we can drive inclusion and equity in our workforces, but then also drive impact in our community. So I'm appreciative of having the opportunity to further the conversation today to talk about this. Um, I would say transparency and authenticity is the, I would say the words of the day, or maybe the words of the year, especially um, leaving out of 2020. Um, in the same way, businesses are transparent about their workforce diversity data, um, th their pricing, their marketing, et cetera. They really need to be transparent about how they feel about, um, I would say, certain issues and be open and honest about um, how they want to communicate about social justice efforts. But I also think um, this is also the age of the talent shortage. So you have to keep in mind your employee base as well. How is it going to affect your employee base? Um, does it involve any specific community within your workforce as well? So transparency is definitely the word of the day. So when you're presented as an employer, as a leader, with the possibility of commenting or not commenting on a, con on a contentious public issue, how does a company decide and what does a good decision-making process look like? And um, I think maybe both Andres and James um, can take this one. I'll let you guys decide who goes first. <laughs> James, what did, do you want to go first and then I'll give um, ROI behind sure. it? Sure. 
Yeah, ha happy to do that. Happy to do that. So, you know, we've had the opportunity to work with a, a wide range of organizations in our community to help think through and address these issues. And what we find works best for organizations is to really set up on the front end a really clear and consistent process about how they make the decision about what to say, as well as uh, when to say something and also what to say when they say it. And so, I'll, uh, Julie, I've got a couple of slides here that just kind of serve as some prompt questions on this front that I will pull up for us here. Is that sharing on the screen right here? It is. Okay, great. So the first category of questions that, that we have people think through around the question of should we say something is, does it significantly impact an organizational audience? You know, who are the audiences that you have? And the first one to think about is your employees, uh, your, your talent, which is the most important resource that you have as an organization, but also your clients, your customers. Uh, it might be issues within your industry it might be the communities uh, in which you work or serve. And when you look at an issue with as broad of a national impact as the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Marches that mattered, marches that followed, it's impossible to say that this doesn't check that box uh, for every organization. Uh, there are other issues that, that may not be as clear uh, that you need to think that through. And that's where you also look at, is there a connection to the core values of your organization and what are those connections? And if that's not as clear, it might be a signal that as an organization, you need to think those values through and more clearly articulate those for yourselves uh, to help in that decision-making process. And we've worked with a lot of organizations like the Medical College in Milwaukee County throughout the last year who have very clearly articulated values around systemic racism as a public health crisis that provides a natural entree to conversations. But most organizations have core values that are going to touch on these issues uh, that they should be prepared to articulate around. But the most important one is, do you have something meaningful to say? You know, why is it that you're considering issuing a statement? Uh, what can you as an organization do to impact this issue? Are you doing it? Um, and if not, say so, uh, and how you're committed to doing better uh, in the future. If you are taking making a statement just to check a box, uh, we always advise our clients not to do it. Uh, best case scenario, you bring eye rolls. Uh, worst case scenario, you bring real criticism uh, from key audiences that you might serve. Uh, the second category is what should we say? And just real, real briefly, you know, there are really three key things. The first is express empathy about the issue in a very specific way about the issue. The second is identify the connection between your organization and that issue. And then clearly articulate what action it is that you as an organization are taking to make a difference in this space and acknowledge uh, where appropriate, where you have had shortcomings uh, in that space in the past. And the final is to think through carefully the right channel. You know, we have a lot of organizations that approach us and say, we wanna put out a news release about this or a statement about this to the public. And there are times where that's appropriate, but oftentimes if your real audience is your employee base and you wanna provide support and acknowledgement there, that's where it's better directed. Or on social media, maybe it's a message from your organization, but maybe it's finding opportunities to elevate the voices of others. Uh, find organizations and individuals who are making a difference in the community and find, use your platform to help raise their voice. Andres, do you want to chime in there? Yeah, I, was, I wasn't sure whether James was then, so I, I would actually echo the comments that James made. They are spot on. You know, for us here at Freighter, not only, right, it was in terms of, um, you know, our, our stance, we have taken a stance um, against racism. We call it a public health crisis. And not only did we actually stop, right, in terms of the flowery words, as, as Kathy and our diversity council actually stated, but really it was about also becoming actionable, right? There were four key actions that we were committing to. And so that now has really evolved into this anti-racism pledge or banner that we have in all of our facilities, right? So I think it's it, it has to be right one in, in terms of, you know, does it actually align to your values, right? Have you taken a stance? Also, how does it align to strategy? You know, for us, it's really about our eradicating racism and enhancing health equity. And so a lot of this actually work for us has been an 11 year journey. Uh, and certainly in the last year and a half, just before the pandemic, 
we were able to wrap up a very um, impactful five-year strategic plan. And we started talking with our diversity council and with Kathy about what's going to be right, the new frontier, the next strategic uh, effort. And we knew, right, because in 2016, we had our watershed moment here when Seville Smith lost his life that uh, racism was a core issue in our community, right? It was bubbling up, it was happening. And so it, we knew it was about, you know, when it would actually erupt um, as more of a movement, right, in the community unrest that we saw. Um, and so for us, we were certainly um, committed to that and we wanted to make sure that we were, um, you know, standing uh, behind those words that we put out there. And then the third piece is when you're communicating, and in our case, part of that communication is always grounding people back to our mission, to our value, especially that value of dignity and respect here, right? Whether it's actually working with one another, because sometimes, right, this could actually evolve as a contentious conversation, right? Or animated conversation between staff members, right? Or maybe something that a patient or, or family member could bring right into the health system. So we wanted to make sure that we were providing some guidelines around that, but ultimately it was about grounding them in terms of here's something that consistently we need to communicate. It's about, you know, you're here, uh, to deliver in our mission, right, of providing culturally and linguistically responsive care. Um, and so that was really first and foremost. We also asked everyone to uh, certainly be guided by our guiding principles. Uh, we call them customer service standards and certainly living up to our values, right, and especially that value of dignity and respect. And so for us, that has been our North Star, right? So we have that already packaged because we have been working with our marketing and communications team on certainly in our communications algorithm that we have created. So we're not certainly um, having to, in real time, to decide, right, on whether or not that is something that we need to comment on. But if it actually fits, right, uh, those particular areas or categories where we are going to communicate, then we know what needs to be communicated. And as importantly, who is communicating that message, right? Is it our CEO? Is it another senior leader? Is it, right, myself as the CDO, you know, Chief Diversity Officer of the organization? So I think between the comments that Deidre made and what James just said, I think they're spot on. The last word that I'll use, Deidre, just adding to the words of, of the year here is, there has to be accountability around this work, right? So if you go and you're gonna be, you have to be transparent, you have to be um, certainly um, also accountable to this work. So if you make commitments, make sure you follow through. If not, that certainly will be a huge dissatisfier with your staff um, and also with your, um, you know, your clientele, in our case, our patients and the community at large that we serve. Right. I think it can certainly ring very empty if um, a statement is made, but there is no action behind it. Um, does anybody on the panel have some examples of how companies have done a good job of kind of following through on, you know, maybe, maybe it's a statement that at, at, up until this point, they haven't taken the stand on, but now that they have, what do they need to do to back that up? Well, let me just share what, you know, where we have done well here. So again, you know, given um, our algorithm, given certainly the stands that we've taken around equity, diversity, and inclusion, and now anti-racism, you know, we've created this algorithm, right? So every time, so for example, when the George Floyd, unfortunately, murder occurred, um, Kathy stood uh, ready to send out a message, right? And there was actually a very uh, compelling message, uh, very authentic, very transparent. She was very vulnerable through that process to right? saying, hey, um, you know, I'm a white woman, right? Uh, but I'm the leader of this organization. Let me tell you why I'm compelled to put together, right? Pen this particular uh, message, but why this is not only important to me, but to us as a healthcare system here, right? Integrated Health Network in Southeastern Wisconsin, right? And so she made that statement first to our staff um, that compelling case. And then certainly that was also shared um, externally um, with our community um, and with, the, you know, with our patients in the community at large um, that we serve. And I think that that is something that um, has done well for us, right? Where, you know, we're not waiting, right? In terms of deliberating or discussing, are we going to actually comment on that or not? Again, we've taken an anti-racism stance. Um, and so if there's a connection, right, even if it's something that happened nationally, like the George Floyd, right, that had uh, certainly repercussions. And we found, right, a number of examples that have occurred here in Milwaukee, where we cannot shy away uh, from commenting when we've already taken, right, a stance, public stance 
um, like the one that we did. And so certainly, right, that's what then opens the door for you then to be judged, right? And whether you're delivering or not, right? Are you being accountable and, and true to your commitments here? And so that is something that for us has worked well, having that algorithm, having a line of sight for when we're gonna be communicating. And again, what's gonna be communicated and by whom it will be communicated. So that would be the example that I would share, Julie. So oh, I think it's, go ahead, please. No, I also just wanted to add before we started today, we were having a conversation amongst ourselves about just national brands that um, I think CJ was saying she received an email and she was just wondering, hey, why did I get this message? It didn't really match the organization's mission values. Um, and I think the thing to remember, because we keep talking about the words of the day, is really if your words don't match your actions, it does seem inauthentic. It seems hypocritical. And something that Andres um, said made me think of it. It obviously is affecting your employee base. But the other thing, um, obviously, because we're dealing with this today, not being able to find employees is just our future employees and future talent that are looking at our organization. Um, there's a lot of different things that employees look at when they're looking at another, their next um, company. But obviously, um, the biggest question I would say nowadays that employees are asking or future employees are asking about is what is the company's stance on um, DE&I and, and what are you doing around that? How are you supporting community efforts? Um, do you have an ERD or affinity group here, et cetera? Those are important things to people. And I was just looking up before we started that I think it's like 76% of um, talent is looking at the Glassdoor rating since Glassdoor added the DEI component now. So they're looking at that before they're going out to search for their next job. So that is an important element today. I think that's a really important point. Um, so Andres, you did a great job, I think, of laying out how an organization like yours um, has set up a really sophisticated process and algorithm as you described described it um, to kind of add some filters to how you make those decisions. Um, and it's very well aligned with um, the values of, of a healthcare system. But say I'm a smaller, medium-sized business, maybe I'm a manufacturer where there's not necessarily a, a clear value alignment to my customer base or to what I do for a living. And yet as a leader, maybe you're getting um, suggestions or pressure from your employees or even your board of directors to weigh in on this. What can some of those kinds of institutions do um, to make their own decisions? And James, I know you work with a, a wide variety of industries and companies, so maybe you can weigh in on this one. Sure, <clears throat> happy to do so. I, I think the first thing is to make sure that you've got the right people at the table making that decision with you in an organization. Uh, when you look around the room and have a discussion about, does this affect our business? Does it affect the core value? Who are the voices that you're bringing to bear on that? Because if, for example, uh, you ask the question of yourself and say, this has nothing to do with my business relative to the George Floyd murder and the protests that took place, I would suggest you need to examine more closely uh, the impact of what's happening on your existing talent base and your future talent base of the people that might be your customers or your clients. And to look more closely at that, because I think you'll often find that there is greater connection to your core values as an organization, uh, to what is meaningful and important to the people that you serve. So I think that's the first and most important thing is make sure that as you consider these issues, as you think them through, um, that you surround yourself with people who represent the diverse perspectives of each of your stakeholder audiences. Um, you know, I think this, the second thing is to make sure that there's a really clear and consistent process for that to make sure that good decisions are made. And that, again, starts with the right people in the room, but it also goes to, you know, while small organizations may not be able to put together a sophisticated algorithm uh, that uh, automatically makes decisions for you, you can put together a decision tree that asks some of those questions that we talked about on the front end and thinks through relative to a handful of core issues that we all know are going to come up. Uh, when and where is the appropriate place uh, to weigh in. And I, I think the last piece on that is to know that whatever you say or whatever you don't say uh, opens you up to criticism from different stakeholder audiences and to be prepared uh, to address that and equip leaders within your organization uh, that if you're taking a tough stance um, within the organization, uh, that they have the tools they need to explain that to others and create opportunities for dialogue with those stakeholder audiences about it. 
Can I add one more comment here? Because it, sure. it came up uh, through the chat here in terms of, you know, um, do you have to wait right for when you communicate, right? Especially when things happen and there's actually a shooting, right? Or someone loses their life, you know? And so here's where we have landed because I know it's an important question. And, and James, you know, uh, just sparked that thought in my mind, which is you can sit here and vilify, right? We don't have all the facts, right? And, and sometimes right, you cannot wait because it might be months or maybe a year or two before those trials happen. So what we have decided to do again, uh, it goes back to one of my earlier points. It's about understanding what is it that we're communicating. And again, one of the key consistent messages is that irrespective of what happens outside in, in right in our ecosystem, right in the in society, not that we're trying shine away, right? I mean, we have to take a stance, right? We've already taken a stance as an organization, but it's more about what is what is the call to action to you as our staff, right? We're all caregivers here. So here's why we've decided, right, that one of our key points and the foundational point is around, you know, bringing people, growing them back to our mission, to our values, right, to our customer service standards, because we know that that's what's true, right? And that in that sense, then we're not vilifying anyone. We're not taking sides with one political party over the other, right, around this stuff. And so it has allowed us, right, to communicate uh, and double down on our key messages without, right, having to necessarily having to become controversial, right, in some of those things. Now, ultimately, and I will tell you this, right, and I'm going to be super honest here because that's the only way that we want to operate here as a, as a panel, you know, have we received some negative feedback or comments from family members, even from staff um, regarding our anti-racism banners in all of our facilities? You bet. But I can tell you that is a very small percentage. Maybe I can count them in one hand versus the hundreds that we have received through, um, you know, Facebook and Instagram and text messages that I get constantly from colleagues, right, and friends in the community that thank me that, you know, Freighter has taken that stance and that we have been very bold and courageous around taking the stance, right, and living up uh, to that commitment. So what I will say is, you know, we're entering this age uh, that used to be called corporate social responsibility, and now it has evolved into the age of corporate social justice, right? And so I think that we all are going to have to decide that if in fact, right, we are investing in our community and we're part of this community, whether you're small, medium sized or large, we all have a role to play. And the question becomes is, how are you gonna be communicating, right, again, acknowledging these things? I don't think that you can shy away from it. So it's more about what's your why behind that strategy, right? And then being consistent as well, right? So you cannot shy away from commenting on some things and not on others, right? Once you develop your strategy. But I think that that's important because that's going to be uh, the litmus test. I think that your staff is going to hold you accountable too. Yeah, Andres, you talked a little bit about, you know, being prepared for perhaps some backlash. And, and I think the goal here that we're hearing is you may not ever get to 100% agreement among all of your constituents, but at the end of the day, you know the path that you have to follow and then that that's just the right path. How do you prepare, and this is for anybody on the panel, your leaders then to deal with um, some of the backlash that they may have gotten? And if you have any examples you can share, that would be great. I'll add one thing, Julie, um, I just thought about when Andres was speaking, I think, and I believe James had this in his PowerPoint is I think the thing that we have to remember is it's all about empathy. So when Andres talked about, it's not about taking sides or vilifying anyone. So I, I think we've somewhat lost that a little bit just in the structure of society. So you can really be empathetic with someone um, or a situation and um, you don't have to be, I guess, um, on the opposition side, if that makes sense. You can really be empathetic and it's just really taking in the human element. And I think we have to get back to that. But again, when we're talking about workplaces, again, we're talking about humans, we're talking about employees, and that's really important. So um, I, well, I can't think of a specific example from a leadership standpoint. I know we have many different organizations that we work with through MRA that their leaders obviously have questions about how to formulate statements, how to respond to things, et cetera. And it's always taken into account is does this, again, align with my mission, vision, and values, but also how can this help us um, be better as an organization? How can this help us 
um, not necessarily elevate our brand, but elevate what we do and increase our impact in the communities that we serve and even enhance that just as we grow and we look at our, our plan as an organization, how can we just do better, do better by people. And the other thing that Andre said that made me think of um, something else is many times people, um, they have to, this is going to sound very confusing, but they have to know what they don't know. So it's really putting yourself in a room with other people who are really knowledgeable about specific topics and specific social justice issues, et cetera. So I think it's, it's really important for leaders and especially senior executives to educate themselves consistently. Um, and this is the time for that because employee activism, I would say, is driving a lot of our change in corporate behavior around social justice. Um, so I will leave it there and turn it over to Andreas or James. Yeah, I, I, I love everything that you're saying there. And I think that when there is pushback, it really is an opportunity for dialogue. And I season two of Ted Lasso just started this last weekend, which reminded me of the really terrific quote, if you guys have watched that uh, from last year that he borrowed from Walt Whitman, which is be curious, not judgmental. And I think anytime that we have pushback or a perspective that we don't understand or that we're not sure about, if we can teach leaders within our organization to use that as an opportunity to be curious and not judgmental about that perspective, to better understand it, because that's what creates the space for dialogue, it provides the space for growth uh, within yourself, within your organization, with those that you work with. And, uh, you know, I, I will, the other piece of that is you will never regret doing the right thing as an organization. I mean, we have worked with many clients who, uh, and, and, you know, boards that I've been on where they've lost a board member or somebody has come to them and said, I really don't support this. I can't get a line behind this. And they've used it as an opportunity for dialogue. And in the end, there was an opportunity for growth. And even if there was turbulence in the moment, uh, I will tell you that every single one of those organizations look back a year later and are better for it and are glad that they did it. I, well, just, I would, yeah. Go ahead. James. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to add that I certainly echo the comments made by Deidre and, and James. And the only other thing that I would add is because I think it's in, it has been part of our journey is we do communicate uh, with our senior leaders. We let them know. Um, that a message will go out, they will see the message before it's actually cascaded. So they get heads up that this will be communicated, and especially in, in pockets right of the organization where we have had some concerns or issues right raised by staff. You know, you certainly want to make sure that you're preparing uh, your leaders there for success and positioning them right and, and, and giving them the uh, key messages right um, uh, that uh, certainly they can use to respond right once the message. Uh, goes out. The other thing that we have done, um, you know, and again, um, you know, we've we've gone down the path of also, again, to Dieter's point, right, educating our leaders, educating our staff is we started what we call the I care, which stands for interactive conversations about race and equity. This is actually part of the cultural competence education. It actually, at its core, it actually certainly is grounded on unconscious bias, which is one of the four key actions that we've committed through our anti-racism pledge, which is examining our own biases, right? So there has to be accountability for me as a staff or leader in the organization, right? And so we all have biases, right? And so we need to actually explore that and understand how that might be getting in the way, right? Or how is it that I'm thinking through certain things, right? Or maybe why might be much judgmental about certain things. So we've created this particular and rolled out this particular program that what it allows is to create a safe place where staff can have this type of dialogue, right? So we do encourage conversations or dialogue, right? Um, in the uh, workplace, it has to be guided again by value, by our value of dignity and respect. So you will not be allowed, right, to shout um, or fight with one another, right? And uh, certainly it's only within staff or between leaders and their staff members to address some of these concerns, right? And allow them to bring their whole self to work and certainly have these discussions within the workplace. But the one piece that we have been very clear about is that we will not have these discussions with our patients or family members. Um, and so we have also taken some stance on, you know, how far reaching they are and who's actually within scope and who's not, right? So I think that that has been helpful too, because through this experience, right, now our leaders are much more prepared. We provide some experiential learning for them as well along the way. So they are able to actually experience that as well, right, and continue to build on their cultural competence. At the end of the day, ultimately, we want to have leaders 
who are inclusive leaders, right? Who are gonna be not shying away from having these discussions, but welcoming these discussions within their respective areas, right? So their staff, all of their staff, right? Have an ability to raise some, some of these issues, some of these concerns, and that they know that they're valued, that they're heard uh, through that process. So that has been also a game changer for us. Yeah. I'd like to delve a little bit more into that because I'm picking up on what all of you are saying. It is all about people. It is about bringing your whole self to work um, and it's about employee engagement. So after statements are made and a company has taken a stand on something, obviously for employees and for everyone, um, these are issues that are ongoing in our lives and what can companies do to facilitate productive conversations or just create some of those safe spaces. I know, um, you know, Freighter's done a lot in this area, but, um, you know, I'm sure even small and mid-sized organizations can have employee town halls or even just all staff meetings. Are there other examples of how employers have brought their teams together um, to just be able to have the honest conversations that need to happen? Yeah, Julie, we have many member organizations that have provided, I would say, structured conversations um, for their employees, which I think enables a, I guess, safe space for employees to come together and discuss topics. Um, I do think when employers do not provide that space and time for employees to do so, especially with everything that's been going on in the world, um, in addition to COVID-19, it can kind of erode employee trust in the organization, um, trust in um, their ability to not just, I guess, uh, do their job, but trust in the employee to feel like the employer really cares about them and what's going on and how it's affecting them. Um, and I think also if you don't create that space, it can stress employees out just with everything again that's going on. So while it may seem a little bit challenging to provide that space and a little bit daunting because you don't know what people are going to say or what's going to be discussed, it's important to provide that structured space. And obviously you can set those ground rules. And as you said, you can do a town hall, um, you can do some type of talk back session or lunch and learn, however you wanna phrase it or structure it, but you offer something for your employees to really come together. Um, and if we've learned anything, I guess, in how the world has changed and just the world of work has changed, you have to create spaces for your employees to come together um, to not just, I guess, it, it's important for them to be their whole selves when they come to work, but also to be able to collaborate and come together and really, um, I guess, uplift each other and also be able to share experiences, which I think helps. Um, people learn and grow together. So that is really essential to really driving towards um, workspaces. Because again, when you hamper that or decide we don't have the time or the resources or ability to do that, I think it affects employees engagement and their overall job satisfaction, actually. Well said, Deidre. Well said. I will say the only other thing that I'll add um, in terms of, you know, things that we have done that has been part of our secret sauce or successful is Kathy as our CEO. She chairs our diversity council, but she's also the executive sponsor of all of our business research groups. And one of the things that Kathy, we asked her as we we're rolling out the interactive conversations about race and, and, and equity, the eye care was that we wanted her to model that for other leaders and for the organization, right? And set that tone and expectation. So she actually did rounding with our five BRGs and she started with the African-American black BRG mm -hmm. intentionally, right? Because we were in the middle of the pandemic or the triple crisis. So the pandemic, the uh, economic impact, right? But also the community unrest. And Kathy's point was, hey, I'm not here, right? Uh, to take, um, you know, a lot of your agenda, right? To tell you what we're doing. I wanna hear from you. And she came, right? with, with uh, certainly a stance of, I wanna hear, and I need to actually seeking understanding, right? And, and really understanding what is the lived experience of our diverse staff. And actually through that exchange, people were brutally honest and I'm glad that they did. I mean, there was one point in one particular discussion and it will not violate the confidentiality where Kathy's eyes actually got very watery. And she said, I cannot believe that that happens under my purview right here at Freighter. And so I was actually on that WebEx of course, because she certainly wanted me to be there. I was not, I didn't have my camera on, but she called me out and said, I want you to make sure that you address this, right? So I need you to go out and be actionable and touch base with that particular 
senior leader who's the president of that entity and that you make them aware of what's going on. I want to make sure that this actually gets resolved in the next 24 hours. That's what Kathy does, right? And so Kathy goes out and she sets the tone. She models that behavior, the accountability there. And so people know that this is not the flavor of the month. This is what is required of all of us at Freighter, right? To make sure that we continue to build an inclusive culture that is guided and rooted in dignity and respect. And so for us, that has been, I think, part of the winning formula. And we have seen that, right? On the staff engagement uh, scores that we certainly leapfrogged this year uh, when we were not expecting that, quite honestly. But we did, and a lot of the verbatims that came through on the staff engagement had to do with shout outs to Kathy and a number of their senior leaders for, again, creating the safe place where people can have discussions, right? Or our commitment to this pledge is including our anti-racism pledge or the MAC, right? The region of choice pledge and saying, hey, I know that you're committed and that you're not only being accountable, but you're being transparent in terms of telling us where we stand today, right? As an organization and how you're gonna actually close the gap, right? Or address that moving forward. So I think that those town halls and those um, conversations need to happen, but they cannot be, right? Um, left to chance and or only being done by one leader, it has to be uh, a collective, right? Uh, commitment here from all of our leadership. So we've been talking about some really um, critical issues um, that all the companies have dealt with. I, I, I wanna pivot just a little bit to talking about, there are so many um, opportunities and um, chances for companies to comment on things that may be a little less in um, the value structure and the process that you've described, Andre. So kind of what can companies use as a guideline almost of where do we recognize a particular holiday or for, I'll, I'll just give you the example um, for Pride Month. I think um, many companies and certainly many consumer facing brands have really um, utilized recognitions like that in their business. When is that really appropriate? And when does it kind of feel like they're co-opting a platform? James, maybe you have some insight on that one. <laughs> sure, I, again, I think it goes back to the, the word that we keep using, which is, is it authentic and is it genuine? Um, are you as an organization committed to these issues? And if so, it's not co-opting it, it is celebrating it. And if, if you're not, if it is not consistent with who you are, uh, then you shouldn't be co-opting it. And it, I guess the other element to it as well is again, um, you know, if, if they're find the other voices in the community that are addressing these issues and use it as an opportunity to raise them up and raise their voices up in the community. But I, I think it all goes back to what uh, both Andres and, and Deidre both said about it's creating a safe space within your organization where people feel comfortable sharing, where the organization actually listens, and then they take action. And whether it's Pride Month or whether it's any other issue, that is the context for understanding within your organization the values that you should be attuned to and acting on, where uh, you have a genuine place to speak out, where you've fallen short and need to take additional steps to move forward. Um, but that really is the process to follow on any issue uh, that's out there is to have the right people in the right room, comfortable sharing, and good decisions will flow from that. And I just want to piggyback off of that. I love the example that Andres was just giving us about Freighter. And I love what he said about Kathy, because to your question, um, if you're going to stand up to um, uh, stand up and make a statement about an issue, a social justice issue, or stand up for a particular part of the community, then you really need to source opinions from that group or consult with that group or even listen to them, as Andres said, which I love that word, right? Um, so it's really important that you actually consult with or meet with employees within your organization. So you mentioned Pride Month. So if we're going to make a statement about LGBTQ+, plus, then we should consult with those employees who identify as LGBTQ+, plus, or if we have an ERG or affinity group within our organization. And then we need to follow through and ensure our actions match up and line up with what we said, because obviously it's impacting those individuals that we um, are making a statement about. So that is a really important aspect of, the, of it as well. 
And Deidre, you, you sparked a, a thought in my mind, which is, and I'm reading here a question, which is, you know, the reality of this is, right, um, and I think Julie gets to the core of your question, it has to also align with strategy as well, right? And so you, using the same example of the LGBT, I will tell you that we had a lot of discussion with our LGBT group, right? And June, as we know, is Pride Month. And we just got, because of, you know, wrapping up certain things in June, which is the last month of our fiscal year, ramping up for our new fiscal year efforts, uh, which start on July 1st, you know, right? I mean, they, they, unfortunately, time escaped us, right? And so the group came back and said, well, we cannot have, you know, the event. And I said, well, you know, you know, LGBT focus efforts here, it's actually, you know, welcome every single day, right? We don't, it's not just, you know, for one month, right? And I think that that's the importance, right, of having strategy and having these efforts in place, right, that it's about the long-term commitment. And so in our case, it's not only about celebrating pride during Pride Month, but it's about also how are we, right, supporting and creating a great exceptional experience to our LGBT staff. And then, right, and those who are might be transitioning, how do we actually help them and guide them and their teams to, so they can transition effectively in the workplace, right? Or as they come back from transitioning, right, um, into the workplace. But also as importantly, how are we delivering in our commitment to the LGBT community? And so in our case, for example, a number of years ago, we became first, you know, we were the first to market with our LGBT centric clinic right here in Wisconsin. It's, it's our inclusion health clinic, right? So now we provide services and care to the LGBT community, and primarily to the T, to the transgender community, who we all know when you look at the statistics and the research that they actually are one of the communities that unfortunately that are forgotten, they're unseen, they're invisible, and unfortunately get one of the worst care, or have some of the worst, worst um, uh, health outcomes uh, when it comes to health uh, equity. And so for us, that really has been part of our journey, right? Again, what's the why? How does it actually connect? And how do we actually right, not only exemplify this during that particular month, but throughout the year? And how are we showing up in the community and partnering with others as well? Great points. So unfortunately, not every company has had the benefit of um, your all wonderful counsel through the years. Um, James, do you have any examples, um, not putting anybody on the spot unnecessarily, of course, but of uh, companies that may have gotten this right and maybe some that have had some missteps? Sure, ha happy to share those. And I've got, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do mis missteps on the national level and then kind of a local example that, that's positive. Sounds um, good. So I, I wanna share, I'm gonna share my screen again here about, uh, Milwaukee Public Museum, I think, is a great example of an organization who has done this really, really well. Um, and it, I, let me go back one screen here. So, you know, last year during uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, marches, they put out a very clear statement uh, in support. And you can see this on the screen from last June. And I think, you know, it's a great example because it shows a number of things that they did right here. The first is they certainly express solidarity and empathy. Uh, with uh, the audience that they were working, that they were speaking to, and did so in a, in a really clear way. Um, and they acknowledged the uh, issues that were faced, um, but they also drew a very close connection with their mission, uh, making it clear why they were speaking out on this issue. And they talked about, uh, from the perspective of their industry, natural nat natural history museums, uh, that they're they've long perpetuated racism and colonialism and acknowledge that that was true of their own organization, uh, not just as the industry as a whole. Um, and in doing so really said, here's where we've fallen short and then took it another step, which is to commit it to action uh, moving forward. And they brought employees together. They brought people from outside the organization together to help them re-envision who they could be uh, as an organization, how they through their work uh, as a museum uh, could make a difference uh, in this space. And then they followed through on it. And that enables things like, you know, you've seen the Nelson Mandela exhibit uh, this year and the work that they've done in this space and the type of post that they put up this year in April uh, in connection with this and everything else that was going on with the trial uh, following George Floyd's murder. Um, and it was real and authentic because it was connected to action that they had taken. This exhibit came out of the work that they were doing, the programming that was connected to it came out of that. And I think it's a real powerful example of how you as an organization can take a stand within the space of the work that you're doing, um, commit to action, and then follow through uh, to, to make it happen. 
I will uh, go back on the what not to do here uh, for a second. And I, I enjoyed this kind of parody tweet that was put out um, from a generic brand. Uh, you know, we, a brand, are committed to fighting injustice by posting images to Twitter that express our commitment to fighting injustice. Uh, and to that end, we offer this, and then it goes on in this way. And I think it captures so much of the cookie cutter type messaging that we saw last year that was untethered from anything authentic in the organization. It was not uh, committing to any action. Um, and I think that's the perfect example of how not to do this right. And I think that we use, that's kind of the counterpoint uh, to what you see in, in the Milwaukee Public Museum example. And a um, couple other just real quick ones on a national level. You know, you saw this uh, tweet and message that went out from Popeyes um, that immediately received enormous backlash online, understandably. Um, it doesn't actually say anything about Popeyes support for Black Lives or their commitment uh, to action. Many felt that it was feeding into a stereotype uh, without providing any further context. And, you know, I think this is probably an example where part of this was there was no decision making process and somebody was just posting something without thinking about or consulting other audiences internally to carefully craft it. And one other example is, is Amazon. And, you know, here they have a statement that is good and supportive in and of itself. Um, but it doesn't address specifically why they're speaking out uh, and it falls short because it doesn't articulate any specific actions that they're taking and it opened them up to the type of criticism that you see from the ACLU where, you know, here is, and you saw this from other organizations too that spoke out, here's a whole handful of issues that you could be taking action on and, and you're choosing not to and led them to have to take those actions later. Um, but how much better would it have been if they had done the work on the front end to understand here, I've talked to our audiences, I've understood where we need to take action and now we have a plan to do it. And that's what we're gonna articulate in this message. Great, so I know we've only got about 10 minutes left. Um, Corey Joe, I don't know if you have any questions you wanna to add to the conversation or if we've got anything that surfaced in the chat that I may have missed. Yeah, the one um, question, there's a couple, but um, one that is a really good follow-up to what uh, James just talked about is in terms of the pulling together different people on a team to decide on a direction for, you know, strategy or how to put together um, statements or what should be included. And Julie, I'm thinking about the statement that MMAC released and there was a bunch of us on the call just really talking through how is this going to be received? What should we say? When should we say it? You know, it, it, there was so much thought that went into it, but there were so many of us from different departments on that one conversation. And, and lots of companies, especially in communication, is siloed. It's like marketing does their thing, internal communication does their thing, external communicate, you know, and you don't touch other people's work, but What's the importance, and I see James uh, kind of smiling and nodding, that it's, this is a completely different approach to communicating. You gotta bring so many different people in. James, can you talk about that? I mean, any of you um, have had that experience, but how important it is to really think about who's helping to make these decisions and what that collective voice should really sound like. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's incredibly difficult to do this in real time and coordinate all the right voices and say the right thing and make those decisions. And it does speak to why today, now is the moment to go out and do that work if you haven't already. Um, just as we would approach a crisis communication situation, the best time to prepare for that is when you're not in a crisis. Um, it is to think through what are the types of issues that we're going to face? Who are the voices that need to be out there? and prepare draft messages uh, that fit within those, those categories so you have a head start when it comes to any particular issue. You know, I think that while you never know um, exactly when a, uh, the murder of George Floyd is going to take place, there have been enough incidents like that in our history uh, that we know that it is something for us to be prepared for, right? And so it is as an organization being purposeful, thinking that through, articulating it, and putting it in writing. Uh, so that you know, here's our response team. Uh, here's the types of issues that we're going to speak out on and address. Here's the way we're going to talk about them so that when you convene, 
you know, it is about checking and adjusting based on the specific facts that are happening with those voices. And you've done that work ahead of time because it is incredibly difficult uh, to do all of those things and to do it right if you have not spent some time in preparation in advance. So Julie, do I, do I have time for one more? Yep. We talked a little bit about our data you mentioned in your slides, Milwaukee Public Museum and uh, Fuel and MMAC just took a bunch of our members to the museum to see the Mandela exhibit. And the CEO, Ellen Sinski, actually talked about how museums are generally pretty neutral. And um, Dr. Burr from the Black Holocaust Museum also kind of talked about how museums and organizations are starting to use their platforms in a different way to actually make statements and, and um, put their positions out there, which is kind of new territory for a lot. And I'm imagining a lot of companies on the, on the call here. What do you think is driving this expectation? Because it is an expectation now from employees and consumers and other stakeholders that there's going to be some sort of position um, and how do companies kind of get through that uncomfortable feeling of like, well, we're not, we're supposed to be neutral, but this expectation is, is out here now. How do they transition? I mean, you talked about it, all of you, a little bit in the strategy piece, but specifically, like, what is that shift? Where is it coming from? And how do companies um, and organizations adjust to it? And that, that anyone can respond to that. I would say the times of businesses staying removed from social justice issues or trying to say that they want to stay separate from certain things is definitely behind us, right? Um, social justice is everyone's business, whether you like it or not. And I would say, um, to your point, um, CJ, we have um, employees that either in our workspaces or those who are looking for employment who just demand more. So that is the market and that is the wave of the future. And I don't think it's going back. So because of that, they demand more and they want more from their employer. And it's not necessarily, um, I want everything and I want it now. As a lot of people would think, I think it's just, I expect more from you because I am coming here to give you all of me and I'm going to work and I'm going to expect to be able to bring my whole self to work. But also I want my employer to respect my individuality and my preferences. Um, everyone comes with their own beliefs and I would say interests and experiences. And the workplaces that have been able to rise to the occasion or accept the challenge that I would say many are um, maybe conflicted with nowadays is just being able to embrace that and embrace the change because everyone has, to be honest, unconscious biases that they come to with work. Um, the great workplaces are ones that are able to create those spaces again for employees to come together and really learn together and grow um, because we're all trying to be better. And again, it's about the human factor. So bringing everyone together and really understanding that we're whatever organization or company we're a part of, we are trying to be better within that organization and whoever we serve, whether it's, um, as Andre said, their caregivers, others of us, we have members, we have clients, customers, you're trying to be better for them as well. So all of that, I think, collides at the same time, but it can be done. And I would just add to that, there's really no such thing as neutrality, right? I mean, to choose not to act is to make a choice not to act. And you are faced with that as an organization every single day. And um, so, you know, when, when we think that way, and the museum is a great example of that, um, and I, I think they've talked about when you choose to exhibit certain things, you are making a choice of what not to exhibit uh, in that process. And so it is kind of thinking clearly about what, what does it mean to, to say that we're neutral or that we're not acting on something? It means we are making a deliberate choice. And is that the choice that we want to make as an organization? Does that represent our values as an organization? That's awesome. Andres, I'm sure you have a final word for us. I was going to say that, you know, I echo the comments made, you know, for us, it was clearly the intersectionality of what happened this past year. And knowing that ultimately, right, um, it really boiled down to communities that have been forgotten and left behind. And so being in healthcare, right, and knowing the history of health systems or healthcare in America, for us to shy away from acknowledging that and certainly highlighting not only that and owning our portion of that here 
in southeastern Wisconsin, but as importantly to say, here's what our path forward looks like, and here's what our new commitment is to you as staff or for, you know, for our patients, or for the community, it's really what really became catalytic. And, and so we're really fortunate to have a CEO, right? It really starts with senior leadership buying and support and willing to take a stance. Um, as Deidre said, right, this is actually everyone's business. And, you know, you have to embrace social justice and you got to understand what's my role, what's the role of our organization, and what is it that we're going to actually then create here um, as our not only communication, but back it up with actions. And, and certainly there has to be expectations there for leaders. Thank you. I think that's a great way to close us out as well as kind of the first step going forward beyond this discussion on um, what all companies need to think about and consider. I wanna thank all of you. I think the insights today were really outstanding. Um, thank you so much for participating. And um, to everybody on the call, we are gonna be recording or we have been recording this session and it will be posted so that if you wanna forward it to anybody, um, feel free to do so. I believe we'll be able to share James' slides, but we'll double check with James on that. Um, and stay tuned, you're gonna get a very brief survey just asking um, not only how well received this program was, but please give us your ideas for future programs as well. Thank you all so much and have a great afternoon. Thanks everybody. Thank you.